of ducks. So if yeah. you could see yeah. every ex-husband you had, you yeah. could at least yes. have your dogs this in heaven. Ducks. Yeah. <laughs> and eels. There's going to be a lot eels. of eels in heaven. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what Wait, a what? new one. Yeah, see you know, what you started? New pet, new you see how easy it is to start <laughs> something? Yep. <laughs> Thank God we have his word. There ain't no fleas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God we have his word. And mosquitoes. Well, let's look at Numbers. Oh, here we go. Numbers chapter 7. Very short <laughs> chapter, very brief. <laughs> Longest chapter. <laughs> yeah. 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 We a, gotta be here all morning. This is the longest chapter other than Psalm 119. This is the long cha longest chapter in the Bible. So yeah, you came on a good week. Number eighteen. Seven. Seven. Chapter seven. And it's an interesting one. Uh, there is quite a bit that we'll we'll glean out of this, but um, a lot of the length uh, is, uh, well, verse 2 through 80, 88. 2 through 88 is just the offerings for the tabernacle, and that is where you get a ton of repetition. So I, I may just briefly go through some of those, because uh, it's basically repeating a lot of things 12 times, because it has each, each uh, leader or prince, as it's called, um, of the, each of the tribes that, that receive these uh, offerings. Um, but <coughs> I wanted to remind us of the blessing um, that we ended last week with, uh, Numbers chapter 6. Yes. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make His face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And it comes, it, verse 1 of chapter 7 comes just after that. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it, all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them that the princes of Israel, heads of the houses of their fathers, who, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered, and they brought six covered uh, wagons, their offerings they brought before the Lord, six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and for each one an ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle. And so... Uh, a couple questions to ask is um, why? Why they would bring any of these offerings to the Lord at all? Um, and that's actually answered in Exodus chapter 35, verse 5. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that these offerings were not gathered. Uh, they were not um, pulled out of people. Uh, it was not like pulling teeth <laughs> to go and get these offerings and make, you know, they didn't go and get people to make pledges. And uh, so much of those things that happen in churches today, um, coercing people or, or uh, guilt tripping people into giving. That wasn't in Exodus 35 5. All it says is everyone gave freely of their own free will. And that's God's way. It seems to be always God's, it has always been God's way. There's not some command to give. Um, but you miss out on so much if you don't give. Um, in fact, when we don't, we're, we're not pr participating in the, the whole uh, family of God, in the whole ministry, really. Um, and so... This is, it's just important to point that out right off the bat. And if they didn't participate, these leaders would have nothing to bring. Uh, because the, where they got these offerings is from the people. And so that's another important thing to, to bring up. And, and another important question to ask. Where did they get these six wagons and twelve oxen? You know, um, it was from the people. And... 
these also six covered wagons and 12 oxen were like incredible <laughs> in these days. This was something that you would never imagine that, that any family would even, <coughs> even have the capability to have. Um, and so this was a huge blessing. You know, somebody pulls in with a Ferrari, decides to give it. That's kind of like it would be, only more horsepower than a Ferrari. You got 12 oxen, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so, so, verse 4 goes on now. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be, uh, they may be, be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites, to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them unto the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon. Remember the Gershonites from before. According to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari. According unto their service. So how many oxen and wagons are left? There's none left. <laughs> he just gave them all to uh, Gershon and to Merari, under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Verse 9, But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. Remember, uh, they were in charge of what they were responsible for was the Ark of the Covenant that was to be... Uh, put on poles and carried on their shoulders. Um, also the, the different instruments that did not weigh as much as the tabernacle itself, uh, being with the beams and the poles and all of the, the uh, sockets and, and different things that the tabernacle pointed to. Um, and so you have kind of the reason there, but we'll, we'll, we are going to come back and, and visit this section because... That's where I get the title of the message. I titled the message, That's Not Fair. <laughs> or is it? Because uh, many of us kind of fall, and can fall under that same uh, trap, kind of that same idea of thinking sometimes. So, they came with uh, six wagons, 12 oxen. Uh, they tallied them up. Two, for, two of the wagons went to Gershon, and the four others went to Merari. Four oxen went to Gershon, and the eight left went to Merari. So those two families of the Levites ended up getting these uh, blessed with the gifts, and they needed them bad. So verse 10, Now the princes offered uh, for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed. Even the princes offered their offerings before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, They shall offer their offering each prince on his day for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Amminadab, the tri of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver ch uh, charger. The weight thereof was 130 shekels. One silver bowl was 70 shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a meat offering and one spoon of ten shekels of gold, full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the first, uh, this was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amminadab. So that's the first prince, um, and that was the tribe of Judah. On the second day, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, prince of Issachar, did offer. He offered his offering. One silver charger, the weight of that, that was 130 shekels. <coughs> One silver bowl of 70 shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour, mingled with oil for a meat offering. One spoon of gold of 10 shekels of full of incense. One young bullock. One ram, one lamb of the first year, <coughs> for a burnt offering, 
one kid of the goats for a, sec a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offering, two oxen, five lambs, five he, lamb, uh, he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zuar. Do you see a pattern uh, molding? You should. <laughs> that, was, that was only two in a row there. But we, it gets to be 12 in a row. Uh, so then you have on the third, Eliab, the son of Helon, uh, prince of the children of Zebulun. He did offer his, and guess what he offered? <laughs> the same. Uh, verse 30 through 35, you have Reuben. Um, all of these guys offer the exact same thing. It's repeated verbatim the, what they bring. Uh, Simeon in verses 36 through 41, uh, verse 42 through 47 is Gad, uh, verse 48 through 53 is Ephraim, and verse 54 through 59 is Manasseh, verse 60 through 65, we're really rolling now, aren't we, is, is, is uh, Benjamin, verse 66 through 71 is the tribe of Dan, and 72 through 77 is the tribe of Asher. Uh, 78 through 83 is the tribe of Naphtali. And then uh, verse 84, we'll pick it up. This was the dedication of the altar in the day when it was anointed by the princes, or the leaders of Israel, 12 chargers of silver, 12 uh, silver bowls, 12 spoons of gold, kind of tallying them all up now, each charger of silver weighing... 130 shekels, each bowl 70 um, shekels, that is. All the silver vessels weighed 2,400 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 86, the golden spoons were 12 full of incense weighing 10 shekels, a piece after the shekel of the sanctuary. All the gold of the spoons was 120 shekels. But all the oxen for the burnt offering were 12 bullocks, uh, the, ram 12, the rams 12, the lambs of the first year 12, with their meat offerings, and the kids of the goats of sin offering 12. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offering were 24 bullocks, uh, rams 60, uh, that he goats 60, the lambs of the first year, 60. This was the dedication of the altar. After that, it was anointed. So, like I said, these are the offerings that have been offered to the Lord. Um, pretty much verses 2 through, through 88 that we, we just summarized. Um, God is a gracious God. He, he didn't let me do all that reading. <laughs> but uh, you have basically the leaders giving and it might be something that, that we've never really thought about is pastors tithing uh, you know people don't really think about that but it should be uh, it, it should be happening for one uh, but also it should be do as I do not as I say. You know, we like to turn it around, and pastors can be the same way. Just do what I tell you to do. Don't worry if I tithe or not. <laughs> that kind of an attitude. No. It, this is where we get the model for that, because these are the princes, the leaders of these tribes, of these people. Are they giving? And what they give turns out to be, uh, you know, that, that platter of silver, uh, this is kind of a a, uh, a conservative uh, at at thirty dollars an ounce with the 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 amount of silver that they had given the seventy five ounces that's mentioned of silver uh, that would have came out to two thousand two hundred fifty dollars each of these tribes had given that much two hundred. Uh, yeah, 2250 um, And then that's just the silver. Uh, when you get to the gold, you're talking about, about uh, 
again, $1,650 an ounce for gold, and this was 17 ounces of gold, so they gave about $28,050 from each tribe in gold that they gave. So altogether, it was about $31,500 from each tribe. Uh, so you multiply that by 12, this is $378,000 in silver and in gold that they're offering to the Lord for the work of the ministry, the work of the tabernacle. Another important thing for us to note is one reason that the offerings were accepted by the Lord. Um, this is so important for us to note. Uh, in fact, are offerings rejected? Yes, absolutely. Do you remember Cain? In Genesis chapter 4. Was his offering accepted or rejected? <laughs> it was rejected. Cain brought his offering. Why, was the Lord, why did the Lord reject Cain's offering? Was it the way that Cain smelled? Was it the way that Cain looked? Was it? No. That, that's how we judge people. God sees the heart. And he saw Cain's heart was greedy. He was jealous. He was envious of his brother. And so the Lord's offering, uh, his offering was not accepted because of the, well, and we learn in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith had a lot to do with it. Because Abel gave by faith, and it, the implication was Cain just gave because he had to. He was told to. But Abel actually gave out of the <coughs> abundance of his heart and, and out of faith. And so God sees something that we don't see. And it's important to, to be reminded of the, all of these things. It is not what we give, it's why we give. That's, that's the ultimate purpose behind it. In fact, that's the reason the Lord will, will accept your offering. Is you're not accepting or expecting something in return. You're just giving it, and you're giving it to the Lord, not to some ministry, not to some pastor, because you'll be bummed out when you give it to some ministry, some pastor, and they don't do what you think they should do with the money. <laughs> no, that's the whole secret behind joyful giving. When you give it to the Lord, you can give thanks, you can be joyful in it, because it's the Lord's. And what happens with it is up to the Lord from that point forward. And there's been ministries that have, that have, you know, taken advantage of that very thing. But in my opinion, the people that gave their money, if and only God knows the motive, but if you gave it from your heart and you gave it to the Lord, then it's not on you. Your hands are off of it. <laughs> Whatever happened to it from that point, it's not up to you. And in this case, in Numbers chapter 7, we're reminded that God is a very, uh, He's a God of order. He knows where these gifts need to go, and He knows exactly what they need for the tabernacle. Exactly all of the, the offerings that would be get, given, God knew best. Um, some of the things that we have given, uh, maybe it's been with the wrong motive. Uh, the reason that we give is so much more important than what we give or how much we give. The reason behind you giving, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus has a lot to say about this. In Matthew chapter 6. Take heed, in other words, be careful that you do not give before men. Uh, verse 1, Matthew 6, 1. D take heed that you do not, uh, do not your alms or give tithes or offerings before men to be seen by men. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 2. Therefore... When thou doest thine alms, when you give, 
Do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward when they do that. <laughs> but when you do the, these things, when you give an offering to the Lord, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms, your, your uh, gift would be seen and may be in secret, and your Father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. So when we give to the Lord, we're to do it secretly, undercover even, um, not really thinking twice about it, trusting the Lord with our, with our money, trusting the Lord with our lives, and trusting in Him with everything. Uh, otherwise, you do. You find yourself wanting to be seen by men, you, you find yourself wanting uh, others to pat you on the back or to start to think of you as generous or, or something. You know, we, we so often can go down these routes that it's all about pleasing men, it's all about being seen by other people, and the external, ultimately, is what it becomes about. God's not into that. In fact, we all know the story in Luke chapter 21, we should know the story in Luke 21, of the widow's might. Um, you know, all these people coming in and giving their gifts and doing exactly what Jesus said, ringing the bell, sounding the trumpet as they give the, their offering, kind of, do 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 you know, this guy gave this much, and, and it was a big deal. Luke 21, verses 1 through 4, we find out that this little widow gave everything she had. It was just not much. It was like half of a penny, a mite. And she puts it in and Jesus said, that's what I saw. That's where I saw real giving today. Not all the trumpets, not all of the amounts of money that people might give. They gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. She gave everything she had. Her whole livelihood she gave to the Lord. And the Lord is the only one, by the way, who knows that quality of giving. We don't. We just know the quantity. <laughs> That's all we know. That's all we have to go off of so often is the, is the outward appearance, the external look of it. But God's saying, no, this is important. <laughs> so... Um, Also, what we give to the Lord should cost, and it should be costly. We don't give to God our leftovers. We don't pay the rent to uh, go and pay our insurance and go make sure that we have this paid, this paid, this paid, and then we, we give our tithe, or th then we do that. No, that's, that's actually not even the word tithe. In the very word, <laughs> if, if you haven't read Malachi chapter 3, if you do not give the tithe, that's all you have to do, and you rob God. It's just by not giving a tithe. What do you mean? The tithe is already the Lord's in the very beginning. It's, it's kind of like, you know, well, I made that money. I, I, I earned it. I deserved that money. You did? What would you do? Well, I worked really hard. How do you, how'd you work? And I woke up and I went to work. How'd you wake up? Who woke you up? Oh, my alarm clock. <laughs> and we could go on and on and on. God gave you a brain. He gave you the ability to wake up. He gave you the ability to put things together. He gave you the ability, the strength to do things. And if, if nothing else, <laughs> that belongs to him. That tithe. It, it's His in the first place. And so when, we, when we're selfish with it, you know, when we hold on to things and say, no, this is mine, 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 then, yeah, we're going to pay for it. It's going to come back to bite, bite us. Uh, and it is free. We don't tithe for God, by the way. It's not so God gets His money that He needs. 
that's not tithing. The reason that we tithe, how many of you know, it's for us. It's for me. It's so that I don't hold on to that money. And that money doesn't have a grip on me. And I find myself going to the Grayton Casino and, and throwing my life away, throwing my wife and children away so that I just can get more money, thinking I will have that money. No, in reality, the money possesses me. That's what tithing does. It keeps money from possessing you. Because if you don't, you'll find yourself doing all kinds of stupid things just for money, just to get money. And you'll have that money for maybe a couple hours, but guess what? It's gone. <laughs> it's not yours. It never belonged to you. In fact, you belong to the money. And what tithing does is it frees you completely up of that. That's, it's such a huge thing. Uh, David said it best when he said in 2 Samuel, this is an easy memory verse, 2 Samuel 24, 24. How many hours are in a day? <laughs> 2 Samuel 24, 24. <laughs> David said, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. 24-24. 2 Samuel 24-24. It's still hard to remember. He made the ultimate but, payment. But I won't give to the Lord my leftovers. I'm not going to... And David had the opportunity. That was expensive in his day. A threshing floor. A, a place for the, the temple. Oh, I'll just give it to you. As a gift. You're the king. Come on, King David. And David said, no way. I'm not just taking something for free and then giving that to the Lord as if, look, look at what I have to give to you. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving something to the Lord that I will give to the Lord that which I won't give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. In other words, whatever I give to the Lord better be meaningful and costly to me, including right now, Sunday morning. We all could be sleeping in. We all could be doing something much more productive in the flesh. Because <laughs> time, time is what? Money. Time is money. You ask people to spend an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, you crazy? Two hours out of my busy life to study the Bible to come in fellowship, to come and dine at the table of, of our Savior. The Savior. Yeah. To just come and, and have fellowship with Him. This is the most precious time, the most precious thing you can do all week. Everything we, most of us, everything we spend the rest of the week doing is empty. It's vanity. It's not really, there's no eternal value at all to any of it. Unless you're praying, unless you're seeking the Lord, unless you're in His Word day after day, most of it really is just fleeting. It's perishing. It's, it's gone, you know, gone with the wind. <laughs> it's just out floating. And Ecclesiastes has a lot to say about that. You know, just meaningless. We spend our years toiling away. What for? It's meaningless. Without Christ. Without this. Right now, what we're doing. Without His Word. Opening our eyes. So, silver, gold, all of these things that, that were brought to the tabernacle to be used, they were costly. It was quality stuff. And these things were, were to be used for day-to-day -day operations. Now, back to verses 4 through 9. That's going way back at the beginning of Numbers chapter 7. <coughs> verses 4 through 9, we talked about these uh, six covered wagons and these 12 oxen. You would think there's three groups of these Levites. Three families, Gershonites, the Merari, and uh, Kohath. You would think you've got six wagons, so two, four, six works perfectly. You got twelve cattle, so you got four, eight, twelve. 
given to three different, you could split it up so equally, so perfectly, you could split it up. And yet, God's, God doesn't do things the way we do things. He doesn't split up things equally like uh, American government might. He doesn't, he doesn't think of things like you and I think of things. And, and we do place such importance on fairness. It's not fair. In, in fact, my, uh, my daughter came to me and said, where in the Bible does it say that things will, will be fair? You know, because you hear that a lot from, from little kids. Well, that's not fair. And our, our whole idea of seeing, maybe it's, it's another family, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's another uh, group of people that we might know who have all these things. And man, that's not fair. They have this. That's not fair. They get that many covered wagons. They have that many oxen. That's not fair. They only have one child. <laughs> that's not fair. They only have this, that, or the other. Well, that's not fair. You don't know. I don't know the burden they have to carry. None of us do. In fact, the Marari didn't know what the Gershonites had to carry. The Gershonites didn't really know how much they needed these wagons. God did, though. He knew what can, and He knows what we can and can't handle. He always provides a way of escape. See, this is such an important <coughs> thing because we, we no longer can look at people, look at things and say, well, that's not fair. They have so much more. Yeah, because they have the resources for it. Because they're able to take care of whatever God has blessed them with, God has given them. It is, you know, that's why I said, it, it, that's not fair in our eyes. Or is it? Because most of the time it is. When we stop and think about how God has blessed us with so many things, and yet... Uh, Oftentimes, we can find ourselves just like the world, wanting more. And what God has already blessed us with, what God has already given us, we ask for more. We just want more. Instead of, like Paul, the apostle, said, I have learned to be, what? Content in whatever state I'm in. And it's something we're learning. We don't arrive at that. We don't. We're always looking at over on the other side of the fence and the grass is a little greener over there. We're always looking and we have to see other people with all of the new gadgets and gizmos and, and newer cars and newer houses and newer games, newer this, that, or the other. And we, we think newer is better, but I'm here to tell you it's not. It's not always better. In fact, it's totally fair the way God has, has set up this thing called life. He knows exactly what we need and how much we need. The problem is, is we so often gauge things in the flesh. In the flesh. The fact, the fact that the tabernacle was looked at physically, you could look at this thing, and yeah, it's, a, it's incredible. It's a million dollar tent or something like that. But on the outward appearance of it was just kind of, sh you know, shaggy, uh, run down, you know, didn't really, not much to look at. Just looked like a mobile, you know, what the heck is that thing? <coughs> where they worshiped the Lord. But inside, it spoke, and even the external part of it spoke of Jesus Christ. Not much to look at. In fact, Isaiah tells us that. He was, he was uncomely. He was, he was not handsome, like many of the movies that portray him to be. 
Nobody, you know, was was uh, impressed, if you would, with Jesus' appearance outwardly. And we so often are judging things, and we so often think that people have a lot because of what the car they're driving, maybe the clothes they're wearing, when that has nothing to do with it. And so often we have to revisit uh, John chapter 3. Didn't, didn't think I was going to go there, but in John chapter 3, we all should know this, this chapter, but... You know that Jesus talked about being born? People say, what's the big deal, abortion? Come on. If a kid's born, if a kid's not born, what's the big deal? Jesus talked about being born. Just as much the first birth as the second birth. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. But if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. And the second death, you don't want anything to do with that. So John chapter 3 lets us in on some serious... This Nicodemus comes to him by night, right? We all know the story. And in John chapter 3, verse... Uh, yeah, verse 13 probably is where we should start. 12. If I have told you earthly things that you believe not, how... You, how will you believe you things if I tell of heavenly things? No man has ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. And he's to be lifted up. He would be lifted up on something and that just like a serpent on that pole that Moses lifted up, Jesus hung on the cross and took the curse of sin. That's what the serpent represented. And the Son of Man was, was to be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, and that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believes on Him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Do you have to do anything to be condemned? No. <laughs> you just have to ignore it. Walk away from it. And you're condemned already, Jesus says. And this is the condemnation of the world. That light is come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than light, because, because their deeds were evil. And before that, the part that I love reading to the kids, to my kids, before that is Jesus saying, you want to be in the kingdom of God, you want to go to heaven, you got to be born again. And of course, Nicodemus, how can a man crawl back into his mom's <laughs> belly? What in the world? And, that, and it's so awesome that the Bible puts it that way, that Jesus made it come up that way, because people think the same way today. What are you talking about being born again? <laughs> that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's carnal. You're looking at things, people that have $10,000, $10 million in their account, and you're thinking, that's blessings? That means God's really on their side? That God's really been good to them? You're looking at things in the flesh. You're born of the flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I guess the question is, are you born of the Spirit? That was a question. Oh, you want to answer? We, uh, we, I need a little bit more of a definition. Sorry. Almost. That which is born of the Spirit. Oh. It's seeing things in the spiritual realm. It's being led by the Spirit. 
In fact, back to Numbers chapter 7, you didn't think I'd tie this back in, but before anything, I need to get back there too, number 7. Before anything could be used by God, anything, whether it was just the instruments or the people, what had to happen? Something had to happen. We just read it at the beginning of this. It came to pass on the day that Moses lifted uh, verse 1 of, chap of number 7. He set up the tabernacle and had what? Anointed. Anointed it. And sanctified it. How are you and I anointed and set apart? Holy Spirit. The oil in the Old Testament always signifies, always points us to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a substance, but we need the oil. Otherwise, you're going to spin yourself, you're going to grind your gears trying to be used, and it's, it's not going to go anywhere. That's why we pray the Lord anoint and set this person apart, set this house apart, set this land apart, set my car apart. Don't let me start <coughs> using my car for my own wants and my own things. No, Lord, let it be used for you. I'm going to ruin it. Don't let it be my marriage. This is yours, Lord. Don't let this child belong to me. I'll ruin him. I'll totally destroy him. So how? How? It's by the Spirit. It's walking by the Spirit. It's living in the Spirit. It's seeing things in the Spirit. And it's amazing how joyful and triumphant, there's a seasonal thing for you, but how joyful and triumphant a life will truly be that's set apart and that's walking by the Spirit. Because you're not looking at your paycheck, and that doesn't determine how happy the grin is on your face. If it does, go for it. You're in the wrong spot. Like, let that be your thing then. If that's what's bringing a smile to your face is money in the bank account, go for it. Chase it. Don't be half-hearted. Jesus won't let you be. He doesn't. He never lets any of us straddle the fence and just kind of, oh, one over here and one over here. No. No, you're either all in or nothing. All or nothing. But I love it, because the world can look at it, and it's not impressive. The world can look at you, and they're just scratch their heads they're wondering why you're so happy why why nothing you know nothing phases you nothing will get under your skin nothing can rock you G david wrote nothing moves me cuz i'm anchored in the rock of ages i'm i'm totally <laughs> joyful and triumphant i love it because we are we're triumphant over the enemy we're we're totally triumphant victorious over over areas of our lives that everyone else needs programs and books and all kinds of different things to, to get over that junk. But yet, here we are, joyful. And it's a spiritual life. It's spirit-filled. Now, it doesn't feel good to walk in the Spirit. In fact, it... To walk in the Spirit, you deny your flesh. You, you, your flesh, your body, is then put into submission. <laughs> and, and you put your body under submission. You See, there's, there's people in the world that obey the cravings and desires of their own body. And you see them, it's pretty obvious. They, just, they go with whatever their body's telling, you to, telling them to do. And they let their body, their belly, is their God. That's what they do. But then there's, there's people that are disciplined. And what, what we want to do is we want to get to the point where, no, I'm telling my body, no. You might want that. You might need that. You might crave that. But I'm saying no. Not so that I can look better. <laughs> Nothing for me. It's so that I can be used by God in the Spirit. And He then fills me with His Spirit, anoints me with His Spirit, 
comes upon me. And it's amazing. I'm, I, you're never going to look at a situation as, that's not fair, ever again. That's why it, it, Paul always talked about, Peter talked about, being mature, being made perfect, being someone who's not childish, not saying that's not fair, not asking questions like, um, you know, would, would God uh, send that person to hell? Would this happen and that happen? Just immature type of things that, that can go, go, come along. No, you ought to be teachers by now, Paul says in a certain spot. But a part of that is, is never looking at a situation that, and saying, oh, that's not fair. No, that's worldly. That really is worldly. Well, that girl got raped. That's not fair. That's worldly to think that way. You're looking at things in the flesh. In the spirit, you don't know. A life could come from that situation. A birth. In fact, we've all heard testimonies of people, powerful Christian leaders that have come <coughs> from women that have been raped in past years. God takes something totally disgusting, totally unthinkable, totally ugly, and guess what He does with it? He makes it beautiful. I mean, look at me. <laughs> something so despicable <laughs> ugly and just dusty dirty rotten to the core it's still working it's <laughs> still <now>. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> waste <laughs> wasteful and he turns it around and makes it valuable makes it beautiful makes it Incredible. I mean, the children of Israel. And you look through the Word of God and you find out, and through the book of Numbers, we're going to see how these people, God looked at these people and, and thought, they're worth it. Even Moses was saying, what are you thinking? But God does the same thing. You know, He's the same God. And He's, he's patient. He's long-suffering. We have got to stop looking at things in the flesh. Me measuring things by the flesh. And start to remember, no, the Lord has a spiritual... Uh, there, is, there is a reason for everything that happens in this world. And the Lord has a spiritual thing. Stop being immature. Blaming others. Stop pointing fingers. We all have to stop doing those things. Grow up <laughs> and start living in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. I'm not really into the Spirit. I'll read the Bible. No, <laughs> the Bible will be boring and the Christian walk will be impossible. The only way anyone can be used or do anything at all for God is by the Holy Spirit. This is so crucial. That's why John chapter 3 is such a powerful... We need to return to it. Over and over and over. we got to get back to the very basic things. Yeah, it's good that we've been born, but are you born of the Spirit? Are you born again? Could you tell anyone else what it means to be born again? Because it's, it's so, so powerful. God loves us so much. And in the end, each man's work will be tried by fire. And the motive, everything behind it, it's not going to be what you did, it's going to be why you did it. It's not going to be how much you gave, it's going to be why you did it in the first place. And only God only God can see those things. Only God knows those things. We don't. So Father, thank you that you can anoint a life. You can anoint a building. 
You can anoint a car. Lord, anything, really. And, and if we bring these things before you, by your Spirit, you anoint us. You anoint those areas in our lives. And uh, Father, we just desire more of your Spirit guiding and directing us, Lord, that we wouldn't be looking for justice, looking for things, uh, vengeance in the flesh, but that we would let you be the one that brings true justice. Let you be the one that's making the calls, calling the shots, Lord. And that we would rely on you. We would place our hope, our faith, our trust. Everything would be put in you, Lord. Because you, you know what's best. God, we might look at the situation like in number seven and say, that's not fair. But Lord, you saw how these things would play out. And Lord, thank you that you see how our lives will play out. Help us to trust in the Lord and not to trust in our own feelings and our own <clears throat> desires, our own stuff. Lord, keep our bodies in, under submission. Lord, that we would be uh, telling our bodies no in those times we need to and that your spirit would grow more and more in us, Lord. To grow us up, to, that we're becoming, becoming more and more mature and just uh, fellowshipping with you, communing with you. Thank you so much for your love for us, Lord. Yes. For he is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. You know, Mike, it, and this is a scripture I think all of us know, is that John, I mean Romans 